Over the last few lectures, we have been talking about the background theory behind the way in which poiecardic group transformations act on massless particle states. We have figured out that the little group elements, the Lorentz transformations, which keep the standard four momentum for massless particles, namely kappa, zero, zero, kappa, unchanged, actually form a group ISO2, the group of inhomogeneous rotations in two dimensions. We have also figured out that any such little group element is parametrized by three parameters, alpha, beta, and theta. And for infinitesimal values of alpha, beta, and theta, we have seen that the corresponding unitary operators u of w alpha beta theta turns out to be identity plus i alpha a plus i beta b plus i theta j3. Here a, b, and j3 are the three generators of the group ISO2. We have seen that there are certain linear combinations of our well-known Lorentz group generators and Using that, or directly from the properties of the little group itself, we had worked out in a previous lecture the commutation relations between these generators. That is, we have worked out the algebra of the little group. Now that we have the algebra of the generators, our next step would be to find out suitable representations or actions of these generators on our states. Now, given the fact that A and B commute, it's obvious that we should be able to simultaneously diagonalize them. So, we should have states which obey A acting on psi k A B equals small a psi k A B and capital B acting on psi k A B would be small b times psi k a b. Now, let me point out a potential problem which Weinberg does not mention in his book, but of course he must have thought about it. The point is, when you say these states are labeled by the a and b eigenvalues of capital A and capital B respectively, that's perfectly fine. After all, these two operators commute, so it is definitely possible to find simultaneous eigenstates for them as we have done. However, the other label that we are using here is the standard four momentum k. Remember that was kappa zero zero kappa. So what we are implying is that these states are not only eigenstates of a and b, they are eigenstates of P0, P1, P2, P3, all of them at the same time. Because psi k, of course, is an eigenstate of P0, P1, P2, P3 with eigenvalues kappa, 0, 0, kappa, respectively. So let's see whether that is at all feasible. After all, do A and B commute with P0, P1, P2, P3? The answer actually is not quite. But before we go there, let me just do a brief recap of basic quantum mechanics, in fact, basic operator algebra from maths, and answer the question, can two operators which do not commute have simultaneous eigenstates at all or not? And the answer is, they can. What I'm trying to say is something like this. Suppose we have two operators x and y which do not commute with each other but which have a simultaneous eigenstate v. So capital X acting on v is small x a number times v. Capital Y acting on v is small y another number times v. An immediate consequence of this would be that the commutator of x and y acting on v will give you capital X capital Y acting on v which is small x y v minus small x y v from capital y capital x, they cancel and you should get 0. So the commutator of x and y 
must annihilate the vector v. Now, if instead of having one simultaneous eigenvector, we are demanded that x and y have a complete set of simultaneous eigenvectors so that any state can be expanded in terms of these eigenvectors, then this result would have told you that the commutator of x and y acting on any state would give you zero. And the only way that can happen is that the commutator of x and y vanish itself. In other words, if we demand that two Hermitian operators have complete set of simultaneous eigenstates, they must commute. On the other hand, the failure to commute does not prevent two operators from having simultaneous eigenstate or eigenstates. All that you are going to demand is that the commutator of those two operators acting on the eigenvector must give you zero. Let us now take a look at the commutators of these two, these two operators A and B with the four momenta. Now for this what we will need is to refer back to our knowledge of Poincaré algebra and there we had actually seen that the Ki's have the following commutator with the Pj's. These are of course the spatial components that we are talking about. Remember i and j run from 1 to 3 and this is minus i h delta i j. Another commutator that we will need for this is Ki's commutator with h, the Hamiltonian or P0 works out to be minus i p i and rotations being a symmetry leads to j i comma h being zero. So using these, let us try to calculate the four momenta commutators with a and b. So a with p zero for example or a with h rather this really is p upper 0. Uh, remember in our notation we are just using the spatial indices so far and I am going to refer to p0 as h. A commuter with h, if you work that out, is simply j2 minus k1's commutator with h. j2 commutes with h so you just have to worry about minus k1's commutator with h and that according to this relation is simply i p1. So A does not really commute with H. Well, neither does B. In fact, you can easily show that B's commutator with H works out to be IP2. And A's commutator with P3 turns out to be IP1. B's commutator with P3 turns out to be IP2. So things are not really looking that great right now. A and B do not really commute with H and P3. What about A's commutator with P1? That, let's work that out and this works out to be J2 minus K1 commutator with P1. Now J2 comma P1 is a standard vector commutation relation that works out to be minus IP3. Whereas k1, p1, just from this, would be minus ih, so this is plus ih, so ih minus p3. Indeed, you can easily show that b's commutator with p2 turns out to be exactly the same, i times h minus p3. Slightly better news comes from the last two commutators, A's commutator with P2 and A's commutator, B's commutator, sorry, with P1, both turn out to be zero. So all these commutations, the only one which vanish is A with P2 and B with P1. All the rest are actually non-zero. However, that does not prevent us from having simultaneous eigenstates of the form psi k a b for the simple reason that psi k a b happens to have eigenvalues kappa 0 0 kappa for p 
P0, P1, P2, P3. Given that, they have zero, given that this state has zero eigenvalue for P1 and P2, simply means that the fact that A does not commute with H or B does not commute with H or A does not commute with P3, neither does B. None of these facts are hindrances towards having a simultaneous eigenstate because this particular eigenstate that we are talking about is annihilated by the commutator, namely P1 or P2. If commutator with P1 is also non-zero, i times h minus P3, which is the same as B's commutator with P2, and even that is not a hindrance, because remember h and P3 both have the same eigenvalue for this state psi k, namely kappa, so h minus P3 actually annihilates psi k ab. And so there is no conflict between the fact that the operators A and B do not commute with the four momentum components and still you can have simultaneous eigenvectors labeled like that. Let me stress that this fact about having simultaneous eigenstates or possibility of having simultaneous eigenstates is valid for the special standard for momentum K that is kappa zero zero kappa and not for a general form momentum for a massless particle. There is another way to justify the existence of eigenvectors like psi k a b, which are simultaneous eigenvectors of these two operators a b and p mu. And indeed, this argument is perhaps a bit quicker. Just remember that when a Lorentz group element acts on a momentum eigenstate, it gives a combination of momentum eigenstates corresponding to the new momentum. However, when a little group element, which is also a Lorentz transformation, acts on the coordinates, the corresponding resulting momentum must be the same as the one you started out with if it's acting on psi k sigma. So, u of w acting on psi k sigma is actually psi k sigma prime. The fact that k is the same on both sides is just testament to the fact that an element of the little group does not change the four momentum and this times t sigma prime sigma w. In other words, psi k sigma is actually furnish a representation of the action of w. Now, this actually implies that under the action of u of w, the space spanned by psi k sigmas for a particular fixed k is an invariant space. If you take any linear combination of such vectors, apply u w on them, what you are going to get is a linear combination of those vectors again. Now, if you consider an infinitesimal version for w, which of course means u of w is going to be identity plus i alpha a plus i beta b plus i theta j3, this acting on psi k sigma will therefore be some linear combination of psi k sigma primes. But that simply tells you that under the action of a, b and j3, the space spanned by psi k sigma for a definite value of k is invariant. And if you remember your linear algebra a bit, it would then tell you that you can diagonalize A within this subspace which is invariant under the action of A. You can also diagonalize B within that and you can diagonalize J3 also within that. However, in general, A, B and J3 do not commute, so you can only diagonalize A and B simultaneously within this invariant subspace. So the existence of psi k A, B simply follows from the fact that capital A and capital B are generators of the little room. So now that we are convinced that you can actually have eigenstates of the form psi k A, B, let us now go ahead and analyze this a bit further. After having spent so much time in establishing 
that it is possible to have simultaneous eigenstates psi k a b of the operators a b and p mu of this particular form. I will now make what is almost a new term. I am going to show that for non-zero values of small a and small b, what this will predict is something which is physically unobserved. I am not saying that this is physically impossible. All I am saying is that the consequence of having non-zero values for small a and small b is inconsistent with what we see around us. To understand that, we have to go back to the relationship between the rotation operators and the s operators. At the matrix level, we had this result r theta s alpha beta r inverse theta was s of alpha cos theta minus beta sine theta, sorry, plus beta sine theta minus alpha sine theta plus beta cosine theta. Now the corresponding operators acting on our states u of r of theta, u of s of alpha beta, etc. will obey the following relation u of r of theta times u of s of alpha beta u of r inverse theta which is the same as u inverse of r of theta is going to be given by u of s corresponding to the parameters alpha cos theta plus beta sine theta minus alpha sine theta plus beta cosine theta. What we are going to do next is assume that alpha and beta are infinitesimal. What that means is this particular operator will take the form 1 for the identity plus i alpha times a plus i beta times b. Theta of course is 0 for this particular case. On the right hand side, if alpha and beta are infinitesimal, so are these parameters which are arguments of s here. So what you will have on the right hand side is identity plus i times alpha cosine theta plus beta sine theta into a plus i times minus alpha sine theta plus beta cosine theta into b. Now if you expand out the left hand side, what you get is identity from this term u r theta u inverse r theta cancels plus i alpha times u r theta a u r theta inverse plus i beta u r theta b u inverse r theta. Gathering together the coefficients of alpha and beta on the right hand side gives us the identity operator plus i times alpha times a cosine theta minus b sine theta plus i times beta into a sine theta plus b cosine theta. Comparing the two sides immediately gives us these two very important results u of r of theta a u inverse r of theta is given by a cosine theta minus b sine theta while u of r of theta b u inverse r of theta is a sine theta plus b cosine theta. By the way, these relations could also have been obtained quite easily from the commutation relations directly by using the baker hausdorff lemma. To see why this is a problem, consider the state given by u inverse r of theta acting on psi k a b. Let us 
denote this state by psi k a b and theta. This theta here, of course, is just a label, not a power. Now, what's so special about the state psi theta k a b? To see that, let us just apply the operator a on psi theta. K A B. Now this is of course same as A acting on U inverse R of theta psi K A B. And I am going to make use of this particular result that we have derived here simply by sub supplying an U of R of theta and a U inverse R of theta in the front here. Of course, all we have done is inserted the identity. It will change nothing. But now, you can use the fact that this thing is given by a cos theta minus b sin theta. So, this is u inverse r of theta times a cosine theta minus b sin theta acting on psi k a b which is an eigenstate remember of capital A and capital B and hence A cos theta minus B sin theta acting on this will simply give me small a cosine theta minus small b sin theta which is just a number. So what this is going to reduce to is the following small a cosine theta minus small b sin theta u inverse r of theta psi k a b. But now you can recognize that this state u inverse r of theta psi k a b is nothing other than psi theta k a b. So what we have is the operator capital A acting on psi theta k a b is nothing but the number a cosine theta minus b sine theta times psi theta k a b. Thus, psi theta k a b is an eigenstate of the operator A corresponding to this kind of an eigenvalue. Indeed, it's very easy to see that a similar calculation will show you that B acting on psi theta k a b is a sine theta plus b cosine theta times psi theta k a b. So, given a simultaneous eigenstate of capital A and capital B of the form psi k a b, I immediately can create an infinite set of continuous eigenstates with eigenvalues which continuously vary according to these rules that have been written down a cosine theta minus b sine theta for capital A and a sine theta plus b cosine theta for capital B. Now this would mean that if you were to observe a given particle state, given massless particle state from one Lorentz observer and see eigenvalues of A and B in a Lorentz transform state, you are going to see these eigenstates as well with eigenvalues which vary continuously. But this kind of continuously varying infinitely many eigenvalues have not been observed for physical massless particles. So this result that we have here seems inconsistent not with physical possibility, but at least with physical observation. And based on that, what we must conclude is that the only possible values for small a and b to be consistent once again with what we observe in the real world is that small a and small b must be both zero, in which case the eigenvalues do not get to change continuously. They stay zero for all values of theta. The upshot of all this is the following. We do have simultaneous eigenstates of the four components of the four momentum with eigenvalues kappa, zero, zero, kappa respectively, as well as the generators capital A and capital B. However, the eigenvalues of capital A and capital B can no longer serve as a distinguishing index sigma which distinguishes different psi k states from each other simply because the only possible eigenvalues of capital A and capital B 
which are consistent with physical observations are both zero. So they can't really be used as distinguishing labels. So we have to look for some other operator whose eigenvalue can serve as a distinguishing label. Now the advantage here is that we do have a third generator of ISA2, namely J3. Since J3 does not commute with either A or B, that is we have the commutation relations J3's commutator with A is IB and that with B is minus IA, we had not considered it so far. However, note that it is very possible to have simultaneous eigenstates of J3 along with A and B despite these commutation relations because all you really need is that the commutator annihilate the state. And since these states correspond to zero eigenvalues for capital A and capital B, that demand is satisfied. So you can have a state which is a simultaneous eigenstate of P mu with eigenvalues kappa, zero, zero, kappa, A and B with eigenvalues zero and zero, and J3 with an eigenvalue sigma. So this sigma here is nothing but the eigenvalue of J3 which helps us to distinguish different states from each other. Note that for the state described here, the three momentum is in the third direction, that is along the z-axis. And J3, of course, is the angular momentum component along the z-axis. So sigma, this quantity which distinguishes one state from another, is nothing but the component of the angular momentum in the direction of the momentum. This is what is called helicity. So for massless particles, at least in the standard state, and as we will soon see, for all states, the helicity becomes a distinguishing factor which distinguishes one state from another. We now have all the ingredients necessary to talk about the Lorentz transformation properties of these states. In fact, of general momentum eigenstates for massless particles. Remember, we are right now talking about very special states, states which are the standard four momentum given by kappa, zero, zero, kappa. But as we have already seen before in the general theory, we can express states with arbitrary momentum in terms of some standard Lorentz transformation operator acting on psi k sigma. And using that, we can express the transformation properties of a general momentum state, provided we know the way psi k sigma transforms under little group elements. So first, let us remind you that a general little group element W alpha beta theta is of the form S alpha beta R theta. And so the corresponding operator which would act on our Hilbert space vectors, U corresponding to W alpha beta theta, is U corresponding to S alpha beta times U corresponding to R theta. Now, the fact that the composition rule for the S alpha beta alone has the simple form and so actually does the composition rule for the R thetas. Tell us that we can actually ex express U S alpha beta very simply in terms of the generators and U R theta as well. U S alpha beta, because of the additivity of the parameters describing this part of the group, simply become the exponential of the operator I alpha A plus beta B and U corresponding to R theta is simply exponential of i j3 theta. 
So the result of UW acting on Chi K sigma is pretty straightforward. It's of course equal to u of s alpha beta times u r theta acting on psi k sigma. Note that u r theta is either i j3 theta and psi k sigma happens to be an eigenstate of j3. So this action simply returns a number that is it gives us either i sigma theta times psi k sigma. So you have u s alpha beta acting on psi k sigma. Now u s alpha beta is of course it is the i alpha a plus beta b and remember psi k sigma is a simultaneous eigenstate of a and b as well corresponding to eigenvalue of 0 and as a result we simply get the following uw acting on psi k sigma is simply it is the i sigma times theta psi k sigma now compare the result that we have just found that uw acting on psi k sigma is just psi k sigma times this factor with the general property that uw acting on psi k sigma gives us the corresponding matrix version of w that is d sigma prime sigma w the sigma prime sigma element of the matrix dw times psi k sigma prime summed over all sigma prime comparing these two expressions immediately leads to the result that d sigma prime sigma for a given w is nothing but it is the i sigma theta times delta sigma prime sigma. So all you really need to do to figure out the matrix elements corresponding to a little group element w is figure out which rotation theta it corresponds to and that actually is pretty straightforward. Remember the matrix w which is of course parameterized by the parameters alpha, beta and theta is a 4 by 4 matrix s alpha beta times r theta and in this 4 by 4 matrix, the 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1 and 2, 2 elements are given respectively by cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. So it's pretty straightforward. Given the matrix W to identify what the parameter theta is, and that is the only parameter which sits in the representation matrix here. The parameters alpha and beta do not show up in the representation matrix. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. These parameters multiply the generators capital A and capital B and the states that we are talking about right now, psi k sigma, are simultaneous eigenstates of both capital A and capital B but with eigenvalue 0, which of course makes the alpha and beta drop out from reckoning here. Now the reason why all this is important is, let me remind you, what happens when u of lambda, some Lorentz transformation, acts on a general simultaneous eigenstate of four momentum psi p sigma. The final result, as we worked out earlier, is that apart from this overall factor involving the normalization, you essentially have a sum over sigma prime of d sigma prime sigma corresponding to w lambda p psi lambda p sigma prime and here w lambda p is a little group element given by l inverse lambda p lambda lp and let me remind you once again lp is a standard Lorentz transformation which takes the standard 4 momentum k mu to the 4 momentum p mu which our particular state has. Now given this particular form for d sigma prime sigma that is d sigma prime sigma essentially has a delta sigma prime sigma 
it's pretty easy to see that for massless states with general four momentum p, u lambda psi p sigma simply becomes root over lambda p zero by p zero, a factor which, as we have already said, just maintains the normalization times e to the power i sigma theta, which depends, of course, on the particular w that we are talking about and hence depends on the Lorentz transformation lambda and the momentum p times psi lambda p sigma. So note one thing, when you go from one inertial frame to another, the state describing a particular momentum eigenstate for a massless particle corresponds of course to a different four momentum, the new four momentum which will be there in the new state for the new observer. But the helicity component stays unchanged. So this is a very important point. Helicity of a massless particle does not change when you go from one inertial observer to another. Now the fact that the Lorentz transformation properties of psi p sigma only connects it to another state with a different four momentum but the same sigma is of great importance in deciding what kind of physical states massless particles can have. We are going to discuss that as well as tie up the loose end that we have not discussed which particular standard Lorentz transformation L of p to use in the next part of this lecture.